All right, so eight through, uh, 1 through 11, chapter 8 of John, verses 1 through 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he went to the temple complex again, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began to teach. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. Teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. And the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? They asked this to trap him in order that they might have evidence to accuse him. Jesus stooped down and started writing on the ground with his finger. When they persisted in questioning him, he stood up and said to them, the one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he stooped back down again and continued writing on the ground. When they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. Only he was left with the woman in the center. When Jesus stood up, he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go, and from now on do not sin anymore. Lord, we love you, Father. We thank you for uh, this opportunity today to be here. Prepare us for your word today, God. You're still a God of second chances, third chances. Your grace and your mercy, God, just cover a multitude of sin, which does not give us a license to sin, but a license to hope in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Be seated. So, so today I, I, um, I want to talk about finding a new beginning in life, about taking advantage of the second chance that God offers his people, you and me. And listen, we all need a second chance sometimes, don't we? And some people even need a second, second chance and a second, second, second chance. That's what happens in life. We serve a God of the second chance, and God's grace is available to you and to me as much as you and I need it, as often as we need it, as long as we need it. You can never exhaust God's grace. And as I said last week, is this a license to sin? No, it's a reason to hope. And I, I struggled with that as a young man growing up um, in, in church. Uh, I, I really did. I, I, um, the law, I, just the, the, the scripture, the, the preachings were always about you're going to go to hell, you're going to go to hell, yeah, you sin, you, you're the sin of death, the sin of death, and the sin of death. And I, I just knew I, 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 was, I, I couldn't make it. I, 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 there's no way. I said, there's no way I, I could do that. I know I'm, I'm a, I'm, I mess up a lot. I mess up a lot. And there's no way that I can make it without sinning. I really thought we had to be perfect, perfect. I really did. I thought we had to, you know, take those Ten Commandments and live them to the T and just, and, and just walk like, like, like this and not look left or right, not be able to get involved in anything. I was, I, that was how afraid I was of violating God's law. When I, when it was, I got older, um, and I, I was desperate for the Lord, and God came into my life, and I was saved. I was baptized in Jesus' name. I, I received the gift of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And I was, again, I was still trying to, Lord, I, I, I've, got a, I, I've got a second chance here. I got, I, I'm, this is it. I made a commitment to follow you for the rest of my life. But I found that though even I was, I, God was, had washed my sins away, there were still things that were happening in my life that just like, Lord, how, how can I overcome these things? How, how am I going to, they still keep coming at me, God. I, I, you know, what do I do? And as I read scripture and as I, you know, I, I, I just, I was worshiped more and, and uh, the word of God started coming. And then I, I clicked. It's the grace of God. It's the grace of God. God gives us what we don't deserve and it's the mercy of God. And that what we do deserve, he doesn't give us. So it's God's grace and mercy that, that will keep us under his authority. So we go through life, we st we, we're still people who are we're still in the flesh, we're still going to say things, we're still going to think things, things are going to happen, but thank God for his blood that washes away, the grace of God washes those things away, amen? So again, we will never exhaust God's grace. There's a reason to hope. So the book of Lamentations says this, in, in the third chapter of uh, Lamentations 22 and 23, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end, and they are new every morning. And I believe that the Bible is true. Every word of it is true. And this verse has two words that you and I can build our life on. That word is never, as in his mercy never comes to an end. And every, in his mercy, 
is a brand new every morning. So every morning his mercy is brand new. So it's my hope and prayer that everyone here is able to experience God's grace and mercy in a new way every single day. Some people have a hard time with the idea of a second chance. Especially when it doesn't apply to them, but it applies to others. And what that means in their eyes is that someone is getting away with something that they shouldn't be getting away with. Amen? That's what, the, that's what that means to some people. And some people see it as their job to make sure that that doesn't happen. These people have set themselves as a judge and a jury over the rest of the world. And the problem is that while they're casting judgment on everyone else, they neglect to take a close look at themselves. So today we're going to look at a story in which some very self-righteous, by-the-book religious people were forced to do just that. Today we're going to look at the Gospel of John, that we've read the story, so let's talk about it now. There's a woman in this, in this passage who had been caught in the act of adultery, in the very act of adultery, and she was brought to Jesus. According to the law of Moses, she could be put to death. To be exact, the law of Leviticus and Deuteronomy actually requires that both the woman and the man should be put to death. So where's the man in this story? The Bible doesn't say. We don't know. But these religious people were all ready to see this sinful woman pay the price. They asked Jesus what he thought should be done. So it was a setup. These religious leaders, they were trying to bait Jesus because they knew that the Roman law, they couldn't, he couldn't you know, have, the, have, her, have her killed. But then the Mosaic law says that she was required to, to kill, to be killed. So now he was in a, they were going to put him in a dilemma. They were going to try to trick him. Okay, if you don't do this, you're violating Moses' law. But if you do that, you're violating Roman law. So here he was, we thought, they thought, was caught right in the middle of the crossfire. So on this day, they were attempting to back into corner. So either, like I said, he had to contradict the law of Moses or comply with the execution of a sinful woman. Again, they could use this one. Whatever option he chose, they were going to use it against him. And they demanded a response from him. What did he say to him? What do we do, Jesus? What do we do? What did he say? Nothing at first. Instead, the Bible says that he bent over, wrote on the sand. So what did he write? We have no idea. No, the, book, no, the author doesn't say. The author, it was John, he says that he just wrote with his finger on the ground. And they continue to say, what do you say, Jesus? What, what should we do? You know the law. Should we obey the law? Again, he stayed silent. And finally, he offered the accus accusers a simple reply. He said, in effect, go ahead. Stone the woman. Put her to death. If you think that's what the law allows it, do it. If it's lawful to you, do it. But then he says, but let the one without sin cast the first stone. Okay, you're righteous, you're self-righteous. You know the law, you do it. One without sin, you do it. And then he wrote some more in the sand. One by one, beginning with the oldest, the accusing men dropped their stones. It was probably more of a thud. I didn't want to break the floor here. But I was, I was thinking about that, bringing a brick and dropping it, just so he would know that just, they dropped their stones one by one. Boom, thump, thump, thump. And they walked away. Now, everyone has an idea. Okay, so what, what Pastor, what, is there any, any anecdotes? Is there anything that tells us what, what they, they wrote in the, in the sand or the dirt? Is there any other historian that maybe is not in the, in the canon that maybe wrote something? And I, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't find anything. But there are some people who have an idea about what that unspoken uh, part of the, of the story is. And, and so do I. I'm thinking that, and they do too, the oldest of the group, the older men of the group, they were up at the front of the, of, of the group that was pressing against there to, to judge this, this woman. So they were standing there, these older people, these older men. As accusers, they were the ones that were walking point. They were the first ones there. They had the most experience. They had the most wisdom. They knew more about the Bible than a lot of people did, so they should know. They're right up there in front witnessing all this. Being in front of the group, they were the ones that probably saw what he was writing in the sand. And since he had just said, 
let he who is without sin cast the first stone, maybe his writing, he was, it was a preemptive strike against anyone who might think that they, they actually could claim to be without sin. Maybe one of them saw him write, one of you is an embezzler. Maybe the other one saw him write, you're an adulterer. Maybe the other one, one of you committed murder. Or one of you is plotting to rob your neighbor. One of you is a gossiper. One of you is a liar. And so on and so on, right? Maybe he wrote some of those things. You get the picture, right? And the older men who were standing closest to Jesus looked down and saw what he'd written. They said, yikes. He knows something about me. They're here on the next stand up. They sent convicted. Their heart's like, oh, Jews, they're looking around. How do I get out of this? How, do I just back out? Do I just turn and go out? Because this is, I know he's talking about me. You know, Brother Dan, I'm sure you've experienced that, but anybody else, you know, who's gotten up and preached after the sermon, after the Lord moves, somebody will inevitably come up and say, you know, was my wife talking to you? What, was my husband talking to you? Or, you know, there's a, did, did somebody say something? Because they, they feel the, the word of God convicts. Amen. The, the sermon might not have been directed at anyone specifically. Like, I'm not directly this specifically at any one person either, what I'm talking about today. But the Word of God convicts us. And those men were convicted because of what Jesus had written in the sand. And as these older men left, the younger men stepped forward, and they too looked. What were they, why are they leaving? They started reading what was written, and they saw those things. Oh, man. Well, maybe that's me too. So they backed out and walked away too. So one by one, these older men and younger men dropped those stones and walked away. So what does all this have to do with starting over again, right? In order for us to live in the newness of God's grace and mercy every day of our life, you and I, we have to let go of the all-too-human tendency to judge others. And we do that. Maybe not about everything, but there are some things that we do. We, we, we do that. We, well, I was going to say that I was trained to profile people. Monty was trained to profile a lot of us. Some people are, and so I'm, I'm right off the bat, somebody's coming and I'm looking for this or that. And God help me. And I asked God to, to please, please just remove that from me. Just I, when I came to the Lord, I said, please, God, just wash my, all that stuff away from me. And I think maybe he did too much because sometimes I forget a lot of things now. <laughs> but, it, but it happens. Some people, you just, you size people up. I mean, sometimes we just do, we size people up. And then when something go, is going through something with, ah, there's sin in their life. Oh, you know what? It's probably because they were treating their kids bad. You know what? I bet you it's because he got this or that happened because he was. So we start doing that. Stop it. We, we, we need to stop that. We need to stop that. And, and the answer, it's simple as this. You, you can't, you and I can't be successful in this new life as new creatures of Christ if we're always casting judgment on others. Ah, she's going to be lost. You know, that just, they, they keep doing that. They keep doing, they keep playing around, and they're never going to get serious. Yeah, heck with it. You've got to write them off, and you've got to move on. That, that's a hard thing to do. I mean, you, you're right. I mean, just like, all right, the, the Lord says, you know, work out your own salvation. So it's on him, it's on her. But, but we can't do that either. And if you want to experience a new beginning in every area of, our, of your life and my life, your family, your marriage, your relationship with God, your friendships, or anything else, You've got to let go of that holier-than-thou tendency to treat others and treat others with the same grace that you've received in your own life. Amen? Amen. I mean, you and I, we, we can't judge others and walk in the newness of life. We can't. We can't. That spirit of condemnation, that spirit of condemnation will eat your soul and my soul like a cancer until it destroys every good thing that God has created in you. Think about that. That spirit of condemnation is going to just eat everything in your soul. That, 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 that miracle that God did in your life, he changed your life, he transformed your life, he saved you, he washed away your sin, he forgave you. So today I want to talk about what it really means to be a, a second chancer in life. But to have a second, I'm a second chancer. I, I am. And how we can avoid the at least I'm not as bad as those other people syndrome that plagues so many Christian people in this world. So do you want to experience God's never-ending grace every new morning? I, I know I do. I, I do, and, and I, I, I wake up. I said, Lord, today, help me to be a better father. Help me to be a better husband. 
Help me to be a better grandfather. Help me to be, I, I'm asking, to help me to be better, God. Help me to be better. I, I don't get up thinking, ah, oh, curses, you know, th- th- this and that's going to happen. I'm not, there, this, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't. Get up in the morning, give thanks to the Lord and say, Lord, today I'm taking a step of faith and I'm asking you, God, change my attitude, change my attitude. So do you want to live in the chance, in the, in the land of second chances? I, I, I do. And so I challenge you to th- go over these nevers with me that all of us second chancers have. And the first one is this. A second chancer never forgets that they received a second chance. Jesus told a story about a man who owed a king, well, said actually millions of dollars, a debt that he had no way of paying. And you'll, uh, I wrote Matthew 18. Yeah. And, and the king ordered this man sent to prison. He says, you, 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 can you pay me? I can't right now. Then you, you got to go to debtor's prison. But the man begged for mercy. He said, please have patience with me. I will pay you. I will pay you eventually. I'm going to pay you. I promise I'm going to pay you. The king felt compassion and released that man and forgave his debt. Now that was millions that he let go. He says, let it go. You owe me nothing. Your debt is forgiven. Just like that. Your debt is forgiven. Later that same man, when he was leaving that building, high-stepping it because he had just been forgiven millions of dollars walking away from this thing without having to file bankruptcy, without having to go to court, without anything like that. It just, you're, you're, okay, you're done. It's, it's, I, I, I release you from that debt. So as he's walking out the steps, he sees another man coming up, and this man owed him just a few dollars, the Bible says. The Bible says that he grabbed him by the neck and began to choke the servant, demanding to be paid. Pay me, pay me, pay me. And that fellow servant begged. He said, I, please be patient. I'm going to pay you when I can. But the man refused, and he put that man in prison. Here he was just forgiven for millions of dollars. This guy owed him a few bucks. He grabbed him by the throat and said, I couldn't pay you, so he put him in prison. Eventually, word got back to that king about what had happened, that this man whose giant debt he had forgiven had shown no mercy to a fellow servant for such a small amount. And that king was furious, the Bible says. He said in Matthew 18, 20, 18, 32, and 33, you wicked servant. I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? In his anger, this king sent that man to prison where he was sentenced to stay until his debt was paid. Jesus told us a story to remind us of this. Never forget that you've been forgiven a tremendous debt. Others deserve the same mercy that God has shown you and me. Amen? The sinful woman's accusers that day, they didn't understand that their relationship with God was based on grace, not on merit, not on what I have to do, but on God's grace. They had forgotten about their own debt. Anytime you're tempted to judge someone else, flip through your back pages and remind yourself of the grace that God has already extended on you. Amen? Some of us have have dirty, some of us were dirty, dirty, dirty. Some of us not so dirty, but we're all dirty the same. Never forget what God rescued you from, what he delivered you from, the sins, the vile that he forgave you for. The second thing is this. Second chances, never forget that they received Right? By putting up, putting others down. Never build themselves up by putting each other, others down. Jesus told another story about two men who went to the temple to pray. One was a religious Pharisee. The other one was a sinful tax collector. The Pharisee stood alone and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men who cheat and commit adultery. And I thank you that I'm not like that tax collector over there. I fast and pray the tithe. The tax collector stood at the back of the temple, not daring to stand up in front of this religious elite person. He wouldn't even lift up, he couldn't lift up his eyes to heaven. Instead, he beat his chest. God have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus said in Luke 18, 14, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. If your spiritual defense is like this, at least I'm not as bad as other people, you're probably not going to have a great deal of success in your Christian walk. That's a shaky foundation for us as Christians. 
God, I thank you that I'm better than the worst people I know. And yet this is where many people base their entire spiritual experience. Their hope and salvation is the fact that they're better than others. And now the fact is that you are better than others, at least some of them. We are better than some of them, if not most of them, but we are better than some. There are some pretty bad people out there, and I can assure you that you are not the worst of them. None of us are like the worst of them. I'm hoping and praying. Amen. But there is redemption through Jesus Christ. So we are, we have been washed by the blood. We are better off in that sense. But when we have spirits like this, even though it's not an outward sinful thing, even though we're not committing all these other things out there, there's still the sin of pride. Amen. There's still a sin of condescension, of judgment, self, you know, of, of judging others. And I can all assure you that this a distinction will not help you at all with your relationship with God. It can't. It can't. See, you received your salvation the same way that everyone else does. They repented. They came to the Lord in brokenness and asked for forgiveness. You were baptized in Jesus' name. Your sins were washed away. You came out resurrected, a new creature in Christ. The blood of Jesus washed away those sins. God's grace used was Jesus Christ by paying for our sins on the cross. So second chance, is we, we don't trust our own righteousness and we never inflate our own righteousness by caring or, uh, comparing ourselves to others, right? We, we don't. Well, you, know, I, I, you know what, I'm, I'm better off than them. Oh, they live there like that. We don't, we don't, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. You're setting yourself up for a spiritual defeat. Second chance is we put our hope in the cross, not on some mythical spiritual curve. Like, like, you know, in school they have a grading curve where, well, if I get somewhere in here, I'll be okay. Or, you know, if I'm, I'm not, the, the, the worst are here, the best are here, and, and I'm somewhere in the middle because I, I got this curve. It, it's not. We're either in or we're not. Amen? We're either in or we're not. So, again, you know, ask God to forgive you for those things. Next, if you want to live an everyday enjoyment of the newness of God's ever-ending mercy, here's the third thing, is we're never going to uh, get a chance to pass it on. So the second chance is never pass up a chance to pass it on. So one day, Jesus and his disciples, they're walking through Samaria. And they reach this well, Jacob's well. The rest of the disciples go into town to go buy a, a Big Mac or buy some, some food. And Jesus sits down by the well, in the shade, waiting for... Um, them to come back and it's about noon the bible says and a woman comes along to draw water from the well and they started talking back and forth now they're in samaria jesus was a jew so it's unusual that a jewish man would speak to a samaritan woman especially this woman because we know that there's a story coming so that she was a sinful woman she had a sinful past and despite her past, see, Jesus already knew that. He knew he was going to go to that well. He knew he was going to see that woman there. He knew who she was. Who, he knew what, what she sin, which sins she was involved in. She, he knew everything about her. So that's why he went, waited on the well, disciples left. So he, out of all of Samaria, he picked that well to go at that time because he knew this woman was going to come out at that hour. So what God, Jesus talked to her about, he told her about the living water that he could give her, that could take away her thirst and satisfy her soul and lead her to eternal life. Now, what's the significance of her being out at noon instead of early in the morning like the other mothers and other wives and other women came out? They came out early to get the, the water to get the, so that they could start preparing their meals for their, their loved ones, for their family, for the day. But she came out at noon after all of them had left. She came out because she couldn't face those other women. They couldn't face her because she was probably doing things to their homes or she, she was probably suspected of doing things. So you know what I'm saying? They, she, they, she couldn't go to the same places because all these women are going to start judging her because she was who she was. And they knew that and she knew that. So she came out in the middle of the day to come and do that thinking, okay, there's nobody here. I can take my water and leave. But then she meets Jesus there. And all that changed after she had this encounter with Christ. The Bible says... 
She left her jar after the, the Lord took her, told her about everything. She left her jar. She just bailed. It was there, man. It just, she grabbed it. She came in here, got, the, just got totally distracted. The Lord took her to a place that she needed to be, you know, relieved her of her guilt and shame, and ran into the city, leaving that pop. Everything, that's what she came out for, and that was gone. She went back to the city and told, and this is what she said, come and see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. So that's what a second chancer does. Right? That's how God's love is. Once you've experienced, you want to pass it on. When you're saved, when you've been washed by the blood, when you've been sanctified, you come out of the water, you're a whole new creature in Christ, you want to share that. You want to share that because you just had a powerful experience with God. The sins that you had in your life, everything you had was left behind there. You walked out, it's gone. It's gone. Yeah, I, I still, I, you're still the same, but everything is gone. That sin has been washed away. Your heart is as clean, as white as snow. She knew that. She had been relieved from that. The Lord had saved her, healed her. And she ran back to tell the people about the good news of Jesus Christ. This, this man, could he be Messiah? He told me these things, and he's given me salvation. I, he told me I could have living water for eternal life. He told me all these things. We pass on the grace and not the guilt. They lead people to Jesus, not to judgment. That's what we do. We lead people to Jesus, not to judgment. And I know we don't, I, in our congregation, I know we don't do it. I, I know that people come in here, we don't judge the way they are, the way they look, what they've done. We don't do that. Amen? I, I know that we don't do that. I, I just, I need to say that. I need to say that. There's some situations that I just, I've kind of, uh, I've, I've read and I, you know, I've had some conversations that I just, no, God, we can't be like that. We, we, we're better than that. We're better than that. Amen. Sometimes that's all religious people are interested in doing. Just pointing out what's wrong with other people instead of pointing the way to Jesus. Amen. It's not our, jo our job to judge. We're, we're not God. Think about that for the moment. What if this group of men in John 8, what if they were out there? They brought her there, they put her down. Maybe they didn't throw her down this time like they did the first time. But let, maybe they brought her there. And they said, Jesus, this woman was caught in the, uh, ad uh, uh, the act of adultery. We know this is a serious sin. We know it is. Some of us know firsthand how destructive it is. We know that she could be put to death. We also know that we serve a merciful God who doesn't treat our sins as we, as we deserve, but has compassion on his children. So Jesus, this is our question to you. How can we restore this woman? How can we help her put her life back together and rebuild her marriage? How can we help her experience the same kind of mercy that we experience in our lives, the mercy which is never ending every morning? Can you imagine a conversation like that taking place? That's what we need to do too. I'm not saying you don't now, but we need to always think of that first, not, oh, that person brought, no. God can still do a miracle. That's what we need to think. That's what we need to think and say. God can still change that man. He can still change that woman. There's hope for them. As long as they're still alive and they can hear the word of God, and as long as if we bring the gospel to them and serve them, you know, but what is it that they need? Yes, there are people that are going to take advantage of you out there. You know, I, I, when, a friend of mine tells me a, a story of, uh, of a young pastor who a, a guy came out of prison and... Um, he came and uh, he said, he, he, he called the church and said, can anybody pick me up? And he, so he went and picked him up, took him to get a meal and took him to his halfway house and dropped him off there. He came back, said, yeah, this and that. And that. Older, older ministers told him, you know what? Don't take him to your house. What do you mean? Because they're going to be there. They're going to be haunting you. They're going to be wanting this and that. So there are some people that know how to play the system. Amen. There are some people that know how to abuse that. You got to be careful. But what I'm saying is spiritually, do what you can to restore that person. Pray for them. And you say, here's what I'm going to, I can, I'm going to do with what I can help you. I'm going to do as much as I can to help you. Amen. We got to have that spirit. Amen. We got to have that spirit. So no Pharisee would ever say anything like that. No one would. No one really uppity right religious person would ever, but a second chancer would. Someone who's been broken, someone who's, who's been covered in sin and been forgiven so much. In Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says this, brothers, if any one of you is is caught in a sin, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him or her gently. But watch yourself, be careful, 
or you may yourself be tempted. Carry each other's burden. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Amen? So he's, cha he's challenging us. You know, we, we, need a, we need to reach out to them. See the difference between Paul's attitude and the attitude of a religious leader who confronted Jesus on that day? Paul's talking about, let's restore him. Let's restore her. And the others, no, we need to condemn her because she's sinned, and you know it. I know what it's like to be forgiven, and I'm sure some of you here too. I mean, really, really, really forgiven. Others, you know, maybe not so much. They weren't as crazy bad as some of us were. And I know what it's like to, to have someone come into your life and to demonstrate God's mercy. And some of you here too know what it's like that somebody came, even when you were at your worst, and said, look, there's, there's hope. That there's hope. I, I have an answer for you. I, I know a way. I know a way. And I know what it's like to start over, to get another chance to do things right. Amen. We got a second chance to do things right. Every day we get a second chance to do things right. That's the beauty of God's blood over us. He washed our sins and his grace allows us the opportunity to start out every day new. Yes. That's why I want to share it with others and I hope you do too. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you'll shout it from the mountaintops because you want the world to know that the Lord loves you and has come to you and he wants, he wants, and he wants you to pass it on. Amen. Pass that on. So when your conversations start heading that way, this just wait a minute, you know, man, thank God that he's here, eh? Thank God that, that he has an opportunity. Thank God that we can still share this gospel. Thank God, thank God that we can still do that, right? Yeah, because it's so easy. Yeah, you're right. We got to write them off, man. We got to write them off. Don't do that. Don't do that. Um, some of us came to the Lord older in life, and some of us were written off by family members, by other people, said, he's never coming back, man. He's too old. He's been through too much. He's not, it's not going to happen. God can still do a miracle in our lives. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up on your son, your sons. Don't give up on your daughters. Don't give up on your brothers. Don't give up on your mom. Don't give up on them. No matter how hard they are, no matter how bitter they are, you be that light. Even for a moment that comes to their home, or, and just say, look, God lives here. This is what the Lord has done for me. And you don't tell them, you know, just, you want to be like me? Want to be like no, just show them. Show them. A cup of cold water. A meal. Just an embrace. That's, that's all it takes sometimes, just to break that. To break that. Don't, don't give up on them. And here's my final thoughts. So today we talked about these three nevers uh, that second chancers need to observe. Never forget you need a second chance. Never build yourself up by putting others down. Never pass up on a chance to pass it on. Now, you may have been, you might have a bent. Oh, I'm a prophet. You know, I, I, you, you're, you're this and you're that, and that's just the way I am. I'm a prophet. And, just, and, and, just, and you're pointing out the faults of everybody else and overlooking your own faults. But this bent has the potential to destroy your spiritual life. When you're tempted to throw this rock of judgment on someone who's fallen, hit the pause button. Take a moment to remember who you are, what the Lord has done for you, and how God's grace is at work in our life. And put down that rock. Put that rock down. Instead of casting that stone, take the first step towards mercy and reconciliation in a broken person's life. They know they're bad. They know they're messed up. They know everything. They, they know it. They wallow in it every day. They wake up. How can I get out of this? How can I change? I, I don't have an answer. They know that. They don't need somebody coming in, you know, you're this and you're that, and it's because you're this and because you did that, because yeah, they know that. Lead me out of this. Guide me. How do I get out of this hole? How do I get out of this dark place? Let me tell you. Let me tell you about a man called Jesus and how he saved my life and how he can save your life. That, that's what we need to do. That's what we need to do. No one's asking you to become their enabler or to endorse their wrongdoing or even condone it. Like, well, you know, I, I understand and, you know, just we got to kind of, that's how it is. We don't condone that. I mean, we, we, we understand, we do. But we also know that we need to teach them the truth. We need to guide them and direct them. Yeah, man, we're, we're the only example of Christ that they have here. Amen? You, we, we're, we're supposed to be Christ-like, right? What does he do? What did he do? He, yes, he called things out but he did it in a loving way that would show them that he was a God of mercy and grace. 
And we do this because Jesus is asking you and me, and he's challenging us to knock off this way that we've been focusing on the faults of so many other people, put down that rock of judgment, and instead open the arms of mercy and reconciliation. Amen? Let's stand. That was my sermon. I just, that's what it is. Just, I, and I know we're people of mercy. I know we're people of grace. I know that. I know that. But again, I just, I want to put it out there in case anybody maybe forgot a little bit, or maybe the sermon's going to touch somebody else out there that we're going to talk about on Wednesday night. But we are people of mercy because God had mercy on us. We're a people of grace because God's grace covers us, amen? God changed us. He rescued us. And we can never forget what he took us out of and what we're, how we're, where we're going, amen? That's where the ultimate goal is, to take others with us, to preach that gospel of hope, God, reconciliation, of salvation, of grace and mercy. That's the God that we serve. Yes, he's a God of consuming fire. He's a, judge, a judging God, and that's going to be when he calls us home. And right now, let's show him Let's show them that God is still willing to re receive them, that God is still mercy, that he wants them to come into salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen?